On this Tuesday night, five Canadians are killed in Nashville. The plane crash investigators call catastrophic. Mounting fears about measles spreading in Canada. Problem is that it's so infectious. The symptoms, the rare complications, and what people who've already been vaccinated need to know. A grieving family. I will always cherish his words and, and, and his wisdom. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's eldest son tells me who is among the first to call and offer condolences. And serious troubles for Just for Laughs. Don't be sad, divorce is just a legal term for no one has farted in my bed in two years. Why the comedy company is on the verge of bankruptcy. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Five Canadians have been killed after the small plane they were on crashed on an interstate in Nashville, Tennessee. It happened last night. The single engine plane, which started the day in Ontario, went down not far from the airport minutes after the pilot reported a total loss of engine power. Two adults and three children were on board. A warning, some of the details in the story are disturbing. Mike Drolet reports on what we know so far. The sun had just gone down as the small plane exploded at the side of the highway. It was sudden and devastating. When the crash did go down, it did, uh, as witnesses described, implode on impact. That impact was catastrophic and did not leave any survivors. So little was left of the plane, it took investigators time to determine its tail number. According to data from FlightAware, CFBWH took off from Milton, Ontario, making stops in Erie, Pennsylvania and Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Around 7.40 p.m. Nashville time on Monday, the pilot radioed air traffic control. Nashville, up to My 30 seconds later, the final communication between the tower and the pilot. Runway 2, runway 2, clear to land. I'm too far away, I want to make it. The single-engine Piper, carrying two adults and three children, crashed into the grassy shoulder about five kilometers short of John Toon Airport. Investigators reported clear skies and no weather issues. We're going to be looking at the human and machine in the environment. The human being, the pilot, we don't know who was flying yet, um, how many flight hours they had, how much experience they had in this particular airplane. It's unclear if the pilot was trying to land on the highway or if he veered away from traffic as a last-second decision to avoid a greater catastrophe. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. There are new warnings about the spread of measles in this country. The number of confirmed cases is still low, about 17 in four provinces, most of them in Quebec. But for a virus that was declared eliminated thanks to a highly effective vaccination program, it is worrying. Measles is highly contagious and declining vaccination rates means even a small number of cases could lead to widespread infection. Catherine Ward explains what you need to know. Measles is one of the most transmissible viruses on the planet. The steady rise in measles infections is a frustrating reality for infectious disease researcher Matthew Miller, given the solution is so straightforward. Individuals, especially children who have received that two-dose series, the vaccine approaches 100% effectiveness. A dip in vaccination rates is allowing measles to spread in Canada, where it has been virtually eliminated. The problem is that it's so infectious that when the rates of immunization drop even a little bit in the community, it can result in these types of outbreaks that we're seeing now. Measles symptoms appear 7 to 21 days after being infected. Early signs include fever, cough, runny nose and red watery eyes. About 3 to 7 days later, the hallmark red spotty rash shows up on the face and body. Most people recover in two to three weeks. Infectious diseases physician Dr. Suman Chakrabarty says in rare cases, there can be complications, especially in children. Things like uh, bad viral pneumonia, uh, brain inflammation, deafness, uh, and a very scary thing called SSPE, where a, a young uh, child can get measles, completely recover from it, but then in the next 10, 15 years, they all of a sudden get a decline in their cognitive function to the point that they're in a vegetative state. Dr. Chakrabarty says it's also important to remember this trend of rising cases is not a new phenomenon. Some of this is happening because of increased travel. We often see an increase in infectious diseases at the time of, for example, conflicts, such as war. So we're seeing this happening in Europe right now. But uh, it's not any one thing, and it's not something we haven't seen before. 
Public health experts are strongly urging people to check their vaccination status. If you were born before 1970, then you likely were exposed to the disease and you only need one shot. Doctors say everyone born after 1970 needs two doses to be fully protected. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. A Global News investigation has triggered calls to reform Ontario's child welfare system. There are allegations some for-profit group homes in that province are aggressively targeting Indigenous youth, and in some cases, even charging more to care for them. It's prompted anger and disgust among some Indigenous leaders and politicians across Canada. Our chief investigative correspondent, Carolyn Jarvis, reports. From Ontario, Global News investigation, to Nunavut. The article in Global News calls for accountability and change after our investigation uncovered allegations that Indigenous kids are being targeted by some for-profit group home companies in Ontario. Our children and youth are not dollar signs. What action will your government take today? It's the province of Ontario that licenses group homes and governs child welfare services. Let me make it very clear, our government will do whatever it takes to protect every single child and youth in our province. Its Minister for Children emphasized Ontario has stepped up inspections and introduced a proposal for fines. But he gave no indication of concrete steps to address the alleged exploitation by some group home companies. We will hold them to account every single time. Our investigation also found that Indigenous children's aid societies in the north, where resources are scarce, paid 26% more per day on average to send their kids to a private group home compared to non-Indigenous agencies. And in Nunavut, which also has limited options, those costs are even higher. It paid 53% more than the Ontario average when its kids went to group homes there. I am truly shocked. We have these predatory uh, group homes that are for profit that are taking advantage of it and it's just so frustrating. The group home companies we investigated all defend they are not targeting or charging more for Indigenous youth but some former workers say their employers refer to those kids as the cash cows and paychecks of the industry. It's disgusting. How could you label children like that? There are children and to treat them less than is horrific. The national chief of the Assembly of First Nations met with the Prime Minister Tuesday and says she is renewing her call for an apology to all Indigenous kids in care in the House of Commons. You always want to make sure that your kids are safe and uh, we're, not, we're, not keeping, we're not keeping them safe in this country. The Federal Minister of Indigenous Services, Patty Hadju, expressed deep concern about these allegations and said if Ontario launches an investigation, the federal government is ready to help. But Ontario's Minister for Children wouldn't commit to one, only saying they will look at every tool available. Donna? Carolyn, thanks. Rebel News and one of its media personalities, David Menzies, are suing the RCMP, accusing the force of engaging in a pattern of intimidation and exclusion. Menzies was arrested in January while trying to ask Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland a question outside an Ontario event. Why is your government supporting islamo Menzies says he was told by the RCMP his questions were very aggressive. He was later released without charge. Rebel News and Menzies also allege multiple charter rights were violated, including the right to freedom of expression and freedom from arbitrary detention. It is Super Tuesday in the U.S., the biggest day in the 2024 race for the White House. It's on track to be a rematch of the 2020 election. President Joe Biden for the Democrats and former President Donald Trump for the Republicans. But they both have to win their party's nomination first, and today will be a deciding factor. Voters in 16 states and one territory will cast their ballots in presidential primaries. Alaska will only hold a Republican contest, while Iowa and American Samoa will only hold Democratic votes. And on Instagram today, Taylor Swift urged her 282 million followers to get out and vote the people who most represent you into power. But many voters are frustrated with their choices. Jackson Prosco is in Virginia tonight. We're going to put it under this black box here. At the ballot box, there's a feeling that this Super Tuesday is full of lackluster choices. There has to be better candidates in the United States, but... That's all I can say. It's terrible. It's another terrible choice for this country. 
It's only March and voters are already bracing for a likely November rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. We've been uh, launching like a rocket to the Republican nomination. At this point, the Republican primary feels like a mere formality, with Trump well ahead of Nikki Haley, his last remaining rival. I am hopeful that Nikki Haley will um, come out on top. I think after she gets clobbered again, she ought to step down and, and step out of the race. It's, uh, it's effectively over. The only question is how much longer Haley can hold on. She's defiant and determined. How much more losing do we have to do before we realize maybe Donald Trump is the problem? Early primary suggests there's double digit Republican support for someone other than Trump at the top of the ticket. Not enough to give Haley a clear path to the nomination. Candidates don't run out of ambition, they run out of money. That fear of a Trump-Biden rematch has some voters thinking strategically. I think I've only got a one option, really. Like Democrat Brent Pritz, who cast his ballot in the Republican primary for Haley. If I had to choose between Nikki Haley and Joe Biden, I'd be much happier. More likely, it will be a choice between two historically unpopular candidates. That's where both parties may come out on the losing end as they struggle to motivate voters to run the last election all over again. Everybody, Democrats and Republicans, are happily, aggressively, eagerly looking forward to 2028 when maybe we'll get a new, a new set of candidates, some new faces. Mathematically, it's impossible for Trump to lock up the nomination tonight, but he could get there before the end of the month. And that leaves voters facing the exhausting prospect of one of the longest general election campaigns in U.S. history. Donna? Jackson in Arlington, Virginia. Thanks, Jackson. It's no laughing matter. Coming up, why this year's Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal has been cancelled. That was John Oliver performing at Montreal's Just for Laughs Festival back in 2011. It's one of the biggest comedy festivals in the world. It's been running for more than four decades. But this year's festival in Montreal will not take place. The company that runs it is filing for bankruptcy protection. Mike Armstrong explains what's gone wrong and what the loss of Just for Laughs could do to Montreal. <laughs> Montreal is often called a city of festivals, and Just for Laughs has been a major part of that, a fixture of every summer since 1983. The focus always on laughter is today on layoffs. In a statement, the company that runs the festival says it's filing for bankruptcy protection because the financial situation of the organization left no other choice. At its Montreal office, 75 employees, about 70% of the staff, has been laid off. Some parts of JFL are run by other groups, like the festival in Toronto. They will go ahead. It's not going well. Martin Roy is with a group that promotes festivals and major events across Canada. He says revenues have been dropping for several years, while costs for the people he represents have gone in the opposite direction. Compared to, let's say, 2019, uh, they all told me it's it's 35 or 30 percent more than it used to cost five or six years ago. Montreal! Just for Laughs has for decades attracted the biggest names in comedy, while also kickstarting major careers. The first year I did it, uh, I had to fly myself in, and I had to put myself up, and I don't believe I got paid. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm here without their help. Montreal their comic Joey Elias was part of the festival 17 times. He says auditions were held in Winnipeg for new acts just last week. Imagine you're an astronaut and all of a sudden NASA closes. You know, it's kind of like you're without a home. What, what just happened there? Now, part of the blame, according to Just for Laughs, is the pandemic. It never recovered. While other festivals are in similar situations and are calling for government action, they want JFL to be the first and last festival lost, not the start of a wave. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Ahead, Brian Mulroney's eldest son talks about grief and what's helping the family heal. The date of the state funeral for former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney has been announced. It will be on March 23rd in Montreal after a period of lying in state on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. And with me now is one of Brian Mulroney's children, Ben Mulroney. He's in Palm Beach, Florida today. Ben, thanks so much for speaking with us and our condolences to you and your family. 
Well, thank you for having me, Donna. I know that losing a parent, no matter their age, changes you. How are you and your siblings doing right now? Well, because we don't have another point of reference, mercifully, uh, I'm going based on the experiences of friends and loved ones who have told me that uh, everything that we've told them we've been going through is to be expected. As I've been saying, you're fine until you're not. Um, you can be going and having a great day until something triggers a memory and, and then the sadness can be overwhelming. But uh, I've said before, I think we're all very lucky uh, to be feeling this sadness. Some people are not have no connection to their parents. Uh, when their parents pass, they feel nothing or very little. And uh, we're, we're feeling everything. And I think that's a testament to how much we love our father. Mm -hmm. Your sister uh, put out a statement, of course, saying that he died peacefully, surrounded by family. But it still must have been unexpected for all of you. Can you talk a little bit about those final days? Well, he, he, he had a fall. And I think all of us expected that that fall would lead to uh, an eventual return home, uh, but unfortunately, uh, God had other plans for him. And so we were in hospital with him uh, as it was becoming increasingly clear uh, that that would be the final time we would be with him. And we're fortunate enough to have spent his final hours all together as a family, um, telling him how much we loved him. That's so so, so important. Your father, first and foremost, was a parent to you, of course, but to the world, he was a high profile political figure. Are you having any trouble reconciling those things, sharing your loss with the public? Uh, no, uh, Donna, actually, and, and I'm quite surprised about that. I thought that we would be having two conversations, one about Brian Mulroney, the politician and the statesman, and then we would be having our own private morning, remembering the father and the brother and the husband and the friend. But it turns out there are so many stories coming out, both in traditional media and social media, of, of the kindness that my father showed us in our family. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, the, the stories that I'm hearing in the press are a perfect reflection of the man that I knew. So there's no reconciliation whatsoever. It's, uh, we're, we are all remembering the same man. Politics is so often personal, hey? Sometimes uh, talking to other people too about grief can help. Do you, have you been having any conversations in the last week that really resonate with you? Uh, the first conversation I had with Prime Minister Trudeau. You know, we became uh, very friendly when his father fell ill 24 years ago. And I took a day off of law school to watch his tribute to his father at the funeral. And so when he called uh, to offer his condolences, uh, he was speaking from a place of um, deep understanding and, and great knowledge and empathy. And I will always cherish his words and, and, and his wisdom in this matter. And, you know, he pointed out that the Queen once said that uh, grief is the price we pay for love. And I'm feeling great grief right now because I experienced a lifetime of love for my father. Ben, there's been such an outpouring from across the spectrum about your dad, even from once fierce political opponents such as Lucien Bouchard. What would your dad have made of that? I think he would. I think he would be smiling now. I think he. I think he had. Um, you know, people people talk about this great desire of his to be loved. I I challenge you to find any anyone. Uh, who doesn't want to be liked and loved. And and so I think it would mean a lot to him uh, that that people with whom he, he battled with uh, are, are, are showing not just respect for him, but affection for him. Because he had affection for almost everyone. He really did. In, in, in our private chats, he would oftentimes um, speak fondly of people that I just assumed there was antipathy and there was none and so i think he would be very happy to see that the respect and the admiration and the friendliness and the kindness that he showed to people who he might have battled with um, was reflected back well ben ronald rooney thank you for taking time with us and again our condolences to you and your family thank you don i appreciate it Hoop Dreams next, a billionaire's game plan to net a women's NBA team for Canada.
You could say it's about time. The Women's FIFA World Cup broke attendance records last year. The Professional Women's Hockey League is selling out. The WNBA is also becoming more popular. And now, as Eric Sorensen explains, a Toronto billionaire is trying to bring a WNBA team to Canada. What does W stand for, Ricky? Win. Women's. Women's. <laughs> Women's. <laughs> Okay, there's a learning curve for some, but for others, the WNBA is long overdue in a basketball crazy city like Toronto. Do you think there's a fan base for, oh, for women's basketball? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thrilling for fans and young players. The fact that we can open that up to women now, I, th I think that's going to be huge. It's going to be something for us to work towards. The excitement comes as sports mogul Larry Tannenbaum appears poised to launch a pro women's team in Toronto. A statement from Tannenbaum's investor group dropped a hint that the businessman known for building and growing iconic sports franchises is always looking for opportunities to champion professional sports in the city he loves. Just last May, a WNBA exhibition game in Toronto sold out quickly. You know, the WNBA is a huge investment opportunity. It's also just really exciting because the people attached to this you know, bid are really reputable people. The men's game, the NBA, including Toronto, has 30 teams and $10 billion in annual revenue. That dwarfs what the WNBA has, but it also dwarfs the NBA itself when it was a quarter century old. 50 years ago, there were 17 NBA teams, league revenue about $240 million in today's dollars. The WNBA is now a quarter century old, with 12 teams, revenue estimated $200 million. The league will add Golden State next year, but the potential to expand can be seen in all the cities without WNBA teams, like Denver, Houston, Boston, and Toronto, which has a whole country as its home base. Because of Caitlin Clark, who has smashed all the U.S. college scoring records, women's basketball is having a moment, and Toronto is a hungry market taking notice. In North America, Toronto is, is, is one of the biggest metropolitan areas. So when you're thinking about where you're going to locate WNBA teams, Toronto seems like a pretty obvious place. The success of the PWHL Women's Pro Hockey shows there is a substantial fan base for women's professional sports. And some fans can't see why a women's pro basketball franchise isn't part of Toronto sport culture already. Yeah. I feel like there should have been one so long so ago. Long ago. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Yes, that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this bald eagle in Delta, BC. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.